etani bikwe rukamulani etani sunyagarani dhayata bikwe ma pamadatta ma vo patcha vipati saratha ayam vo amha kang anusasananti So that little uh, Pali phrase that I just recited is one of the common uh, stock phrases we find throughout the suttas, throughout the, uh, the earliest strata of the Buddhist scriptures. And uh, roughly translated, it, it says something like, here are these uh, uh, empty huts, here are these roots of trees. Meditate, do literally jahayata literally do jhanas. Don't uh, be negligent. Don't regret it later. This is our instruction to you. This is our anusasana. This is almost like, literally, this is the teaching. This is what, this is what I have to give you. And the, the Buddha prefaced, usually prefaced that saying by, by, uh, by saying, uh, I've done for you what a teacher should do out of compassion who wishes the welfare of his disciples. Yeah. Now, the, So the point of this saying is to say, well, now the rest of it's up to you. He's already done his bit. So the Buddha's job is to teach the Dhamma, to show the way. <laughs> then it's up to the disciples. So this aspect of Buddhism is something which um, it's not easy to, uh, <coughs> to accept sometimes. I remember my first uh, failed attempt at uh, interfaith dialogue was when I was uh, just arrived at Wat Nanachat in Thailand. And uh, I'd been there for a few weeks. And I didn't know much about Buddhism at the time. And there was a group of Christians came along to the monastery and stayed there for a while. I can't remember what group they were from or anything about it, except that we met them one night and had a discussion about uh, Buddhism and Christianity. And uh, at the end of the discussion, one of the uh, people said, well, it seems, one of the Christian people said, well, it seems that, uh, you know, really Buddhism and Christianity are pretty much both the same because we both think that we have to rely on somebody else to save us. <laughs> and all the Buddhists in the group kind of looked at each other and shook our heads. <laughs> no, that's, that's. So, this is the thing. The Buddha points out the way and we have to follow it. It's up to us. And that's that's a very much. I always think it's a very mature approach to take. That that we can't uh, ask too much of the Buddha. You know, we think about think about the poor old Buddha. We have to have compassion for him. You know, so much weight is put on his shoulders. You know, he sits there. His, his back's still straight. You know, he still manages to carry it with dignity. But there's so much weight of of projection and expectation placed upon this one man. Yeah, you know, he's only a bloke, right? I know it sounds a bit heretical, but it's true, yeah? He's only one man. <laughs> and, you know, so much expectation that, uh, you know, it's like the word Buddha. It's almost like this magical word, which uh, kind of evokes uh, so much uh, a kind of a resonance. But, what, <clears throat> of course, what the Buddha was always wanting and pointing to was uh, uh, asking us to practice and uh, in the makes that very pointedly in the the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta where uh, he's just about to pass away and just as he's lying on his deathbed then the gods come from all the four directions and start sprinkling petals and flowers all over him uh, and making offerings and worshipping and the Buddha says, well, this isn't the proper way to worship the, the, worship the Tathagata, to worship the Buddha, but anybody who practices the way that I've taught, they're the one who really worships the Tathagata. So this is something that's always to bear in mind. Yeah? And we do the, the, the external forms of Buddhism, the bowing and the shrines, and these are very beautiful, uh, simple forms. Yeah? And they, they help us to evoke a certain direction in our mind, so to raise the qualities of the Buddha to our minds. But that's all. That's not the essence of the practice. Actually, we don't need to do any of those kinds of things. In the earliest times in Buddhism, 
for hundreds of years, they never had any Buddha images. Yeah? So this was a, an invention nearly 500 years after the Buddha passed away before they started to invent images of the Buddha. So come back to practice, and, and of course practice encompasses our whole life. It encompasses every breath we take. It encompasses uh, each step we make. It encompasses every word that we speak to others. It encompasses the choices that we make in how to live, how to, how to make a livelihood, how to be with our family. All of those things come, with, come within the realm of practice in Buddhism. But when we talk about practice more specifically and more, um, uh, and more directly, the, the, the core of practice, the heart of practice, then we, we, can't, we talk about meditation, the idea of meditation. And Buddhism, of all, it, of all the religions in the world, is the one which is the most centered and based upon the practice of meditation. And certainly it's true that, that meditation is found within all of the religious traditions in the world. The Christians have meditation, uh, the Muslims have their Sufis, the, there's a strong meditation tradition within Hinduism, uh, Jainism, Taoism. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's in Buddhism in specifically where meditation is the most central uh, practice. And that's, of course, symbolized by the fact that the Buddha image is the image of a man sitting in meditation. Now, when we come to talk about meditation, of course, there are many different uh, aspects to that and, and many things to be uh, said and to be learnt and to be practiced. And what I'd like to focus on for tonight, uh, I was reminded that uh, we had our... Um, uh, event all night meditation sit just the other night uh, last Saturday night and uh, we called it the Jhanathon and uh, that was a bit kind of slightly tongue in cheek uh, uh, phrase it was just kind of rolled off the tongue better than meditatathon which <laughs> didn't quite work all that well it's a bit kind of clumsy so Jhanathon sort of got a nice ring to it uh, and, well, we hope that some of the people sitting there manage to get, get into jhanas. And uh, what I'd like to talk a bit about tonight is this uh, question of jhanas. It was raised uh, last week's talk, and um, we discussed it a little bit then, but I'd just like to talk a little bit more about it for tonight. Now, when we talk about <coughs> jhana, uh, this is, this is a, a Pali word which uh, Sanskrit form of it is dhyana. In Thai they say chan. In Chinese they also say chan. In uh, Korean, son. In Japanese, uh, of course, pronounced zen. And uh, when we use it within Buddhism, uh, it refers to uh, a specific and fairly clearly and consistently defined set of progressive uh, uh, mental states. Okay? So these are like attainments of deep concentration, and deep clarity, uh, and deep purity of mind, which uh, uh, can be reached through the practice of meditation. Now, there's some confusion about this because uh, <clears throat> the word jhana in uh, the Indic idiom um, is uh, used in, a, of course, a variety of words. It's just a word, yeah? And it, it comes from a number of different roots which have kind of amalgamated in a particular form in the Pali language. But the... Uh, um, the the kind of the deepest and I think most important root of the word jhana in uh, in the Indic uh, sphere can be traced back as far as the Vedas, which were perhaps a thousand years before the Buddha. And 
in in the Vedas, the the root, the relevant root there is the root dhi, which is related to the word jhana in the Sanskrit dhyana. You can sort of hear the similarity in dhi. For example, in the Gayatri mantra in the Rig Veda, which is the most famous of all the Vedic hymns and mantras. Uh, if I can remember the Gayatri mantra off the top of my head. Um, uh, Tad Savitur Varenyang is, uh, it starts out um, that Tad Savitur Varenyang Bargo Devasya Dimahi. Something like um, we. Uh, we, we, we lift up our, our contemplation uh, to that radiant, uh, shining, uh, the rising sun, which is the, uh, uh, which is the, the, the divinity, uh, that excellent divinity of the dawn, something like that. Um, and then the next line is, Dihoyo na prachodaya who uh, who is the one who inspires or uplifts our thought or uplifts our mind, something like that. So the idea is that there's a contemplation of, con of the sun and the, 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 the dawning radiance, which is a, a conceived as being a divine force, which is uplifting and raising one's mind or one's consciousness. And the word that's used for, for, for the mind or consciousness in that context is the word dhi or the word, word which we have in Pali or in Buddhism as jhana. Okay? So this is where this is you can see the origin of that is coming from. So this idea of the appearance of a radiant light which is associated with the dawning of, of consciousness and the raising of the mind above the um, uh, the, the the mundane, the expansion of consciousness. In the uh, Pali scriptures and the Buddhist texts, the jhana is used in a, in a variety of different contexts uh, and ways. But when it's used specifically in the context of meditation, it's used in quite a specific way. And it's important to be aware of this. It's, not, it's never used in a general sense to mean just meditation. Okay? Now often when we read translations of Buddhist scriptures, they will translate jhana, the word jhana as meditation. Right? And it's quite an incorrect translation. So you should be aware of this. So for example, the, the, uh, the, the passage which I just uh, recited at the beginning of the talk, practice jhanas, yeah, is what the Buddha says. But they often they translate it as meditate. And it gives you quite a different spin on it. Yeah? You think that the Buddha is saying just do meditation. Actually what he's saying is do jhanas. Right? Now when we look at the way that jhanas is defined specifically within the early scriptures, it's always what we call the four jhanas. So this is like four stages of concentration, four stages of deep meditation. And uh, it's always very consistent. Uh, it's described in the same way in, in countless passages, and it's described in exactly identical form across every school of Buddhism and every every known uh, recension of the Buddhist scriptures right, is described in exactly the same way. When we encounter that phenomenon, yeah, when we encounter that the fact that that something appears so consistently uh, throughout uh, Buddhist scriptures from Sri Lanka to Kashmir to Japan, then that tells us that uh, uh, there's something very central about that that passage that nobody wanted to change it. There's something quite specific in the way that the, this uh, is, is meant, and meant to be described. When we're practicing our meditation, we sit down to meditate, we adopt the posture of meditation, we set our body in a certain way. We withdraw our mind into ourselves. We focus on the present moment. And we uh, devote ourselves, pay, paying attention to a, a specific meditation object. Okay? 
Now, that meditation object may be meditation on the breath. It may be meditation on loving kindness that we did earlier. It may be meditation on a candle. It may be meditation on a meditation word. Maybe we, we choose Om or Buddha or something as a meditation word. Uh, it may be a kind of visualization. Uh, maybe meditation on feelings or, in, or sensations in the body or, uh, and so on and so forth. Many different kinds of things we can learn to meditate on. The choice of meditation object is important. Yeah? It will uh, affect how the meditation goes. Yeah? But the choice of meditation object is not the crucial thing. Okay? That's just, that's, that's like, you know, somebody offers you an apple juice or an orange juice or a whatever, mango juice or something like that. Maybe you prefer one or the other, and maybe one or the other is better for you or something like that. But actually, at the end of the day, they'll all quench your thirst. Yeah? So it is important to, to choose our meditation object carefully and to develop it in the right way. But at the end of the day, that's not the point. Right? The point is not the actual meditation object that we're using. At the end of the day, the important thing is how are we able to purify our mind? Okay, that's what we're meditating for. We realize that this, the distress, the suffering, the anguish, the anxiety that we feel and experience in our life is because of the misuse of our mind. It's because of the presence in our mind of what we call kilesa. You see the Pali word kilesa, the Sanskrit they call klesha. And it's sometimes def uh, uh, translated as defilement, sometimes as afflictive emotions uh, or unskillful qualities of mind, uh, however you want to choose to, def to, to uh, define that or translate it. So according to Buddhist psychology, the stress and anxiety that we feel comes from these kilesa, these qualities of the mind which appear okay, and which cause us stress. And the essential point is that they do not have to be there. Right? Those defilements, those, those uh, uh, distortions, corruptions in the mind are just things that pass through. They're behaviors of the mind. They're not the essence of the mind. I mentioned at the beginning, I mentioned that we don't have an idea of uh, original sin in Buddhism. Yeah? So we don't have any idea that there's this kind of underlying corruption which, which is in the mind. We don't have the, the, these things aren't intrinsic. It's just that these things pass through. They're called agantukehi. Uh, they're called these, these um, transient, like wandering through, these defilements which wander through the mind. So they don't have to be there. Okay? We can act in, so, in such a way, act with our mind in such a way as to dispel them, as to leave them behind. Right? When we do so, we experience an unparalleled sense of joy, of ease, and of light. Now, during the course of our meditation, as we're going little bit by little bit, we'll learn to abandon these things bit by bit. Okay? And the peace that you feel in your meditation Whatever peace, whatever joy, whatever lightness you feel at the end of your meditation is the result of having abandoned some of these defilements, okay? To, to a certain degree, okay? So we abandon them bit by bit during the meditation. Every moment of mindfulness, then the defilements won't coexist with these moments of mindfulness. So the more we can make our mindfulness continuous, then the defilements won't arise. Okay? If we're able to make a mindfulness uninterrupted, every moment, constant, then there's no opportunity for the defilements to arise within that. Now, according to uh, the theory of Buddhist psychology, these uh, defilements or, or negative tendencies of the mind arise at three levels. The most coarse level is on the level of behavior. Okay, so behavior through body and speech. Uh, so that means we actually do unethical actions, yeah, and we, we transgress in a way that causes harm to ourselves or others. We break the law, or we hurt somebody, or something like that. And that's the coarsest level. And those the kinds of defilements are overcome through keeping our precepts, okay, so through ethical conduct, 
we overcome that level of defilement. That's the coarsest level. The next level of defilement is at a more subtle level, and uh, that's the uh, the level of mental, the arising of mental unwholesome or unskillful qualities, uh, such as feelings of anger, aversion, feelings of uh, greed and covetousness, uh, uh, the restlessness of the mind, anxiety, stress in the mind, and so on. These things all come up at that level. And that level, that second level, is abandoned through the practice of meditation, but specifically through the practice of jhana. And then finally is the third level of the defilements, which is the what we call that the underlying uh, um, tendencies. Okay, uh, we call it anusaya, and those underlying tendencies are overcome through the development of insight. Okay, and these the abandoning of these three levels of defilements happens in progressive order. We can't skip over stages. We can't just go from one to the other. We can't, for example, leave out a practice of ethics and think, oh, that sounds too boring. I'm going to just jump over that and get into the good samadhi stuff. That sounds like much more fun. Yeah? It doesn't work. Well, actually, the problem is, actually, that it does work. And that's the problem. The problem is you can actually leapfrog over these things, right? and experience something which is on the far, far side of it yeah, for a while. Yeah? But, the, but you haven't built up the stability. So, for example, you can live a very dissolute, indulgent life, go on a 10-day retreat, yeah, bash your head against a wall for eight days, and then on the ninth day find some peace of mind. Think, oh, that's really terrific. And then you can go back to doing what you were doing before. Yeah? So it's possible to do that, but there's no stability. So this again leads to an even stronger sense of delusion. We haven't developed things gradually, and so that the, the the proper development isn't there. <clears throat> so if we're developing it properly, we have a good basis on on sila on our precepts, and we develop the uh, samadhi, the uh, uh, concentration of mind, which is always defined as the the four jhanas. <clears throat> now, when we come to talk about the jhanas themselves. Remember that the jhanas are the result of meditation. Right? So you can't do jhanas. Right? Jhanas are the result of stopping doing. Okay? Precisely. When we stop doing, that state of mind is what we call jhanas. So what we do when we sit to meditate is we develop those qualities of mind through our meditation which are conducive and helpful and supportive to the mind attaining jhanas. And each step of the way, as we practice deeper and deeper and deeper, we feel that sense of letting go, the abandoning of the unwholesome, unskillful qualities, the defilements, and the, the strengthening of our mindfulness, of our clarity, of our peace and tranquility, and, this, and the, 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 especially the important thing, like remember that, that simile, there's, there's a, a simile is very powerful I'm from the Gayatri Mantra. I was just looking at that a few days ago. I was really struck by how powerful that was, that, that idea that, that the, the inspiration for the idea of the awakening mind yeah, comes from the idea of the rising sun. Yeah? And so we're seeing this. This is actually what it's like. The mind, when it becomes purified through meditation and through samadhi, actually begins to appear like the rising sun begins to manifest itself as a sense of radiance. This is one of the most famous sayings of the Buddha, that when, when you abandon the uh, defilements of the mind, the darknesses, obscurities of the mind, then the mind becomes radiant okay, through the practice of meditation. That's what, that's what happens. Now, during meditation, if one's able to develop it to that stage where, where the, all of the... The, the, the bad qualities of mind, the restlessness, the doubt, the worry, the anxiety, all of those things gradually get left behind, little by little drop away, and the focus on the meditation object becomes stronger. What happens is that it's as if one goes inside that uh, place. You go inside the meditation object. So it's a great mistake to think of uh, these these things of jhana or samadhi as being 
narrow or constricted states of mind. They're the very opposite of that. They're very broad, very expansive uh, states of mind. And when the Buddha was speaking of them, he would describe them with words like apamana, is like Im- uh, immeasurable, yeah? uh, vipula, is ex- extensive, mahagata, is grown great. So all of these words inside, there's no boundaries, there's no, there's no limits on, on uh, the sense of uh, awareness. Now, as you develop meditation, is the, the, one of the key points I'm trying, I want to get across here is that the experience of jhana is not something different from the, uh, the, the tiny little bits of letting go which you do every time you sit in meditation. Okay? It's not something different in kind. It's just, it's just the perfection of that letting go. Letting go little bit by little bit. It's a beautiful phrase in the Pali. Relying on letting go, one gains samadhi, one gains one-pointedness of mind. So relying on letting go. So the practice of jhana is not the practice of getting attached to something, of grabbing hold of something, of identifying with something. It comes from the practice of letting go, allowing the mind to find its natural course. I'm sure many of you have experienced when you try to sit down to meditate, you try to watch your breath, and this, the, you get this, this um, feeling of um, tightness that comes in with your, with, when watching the breath or whatever meditation you're doing. But it actually is one of these things which is clearest in, in breath meditation. And you feel you want to watch the breath and feel relaxed with it and at ease, and actually you, you find yourself getting tight. Yeah? You, you, you find you're getting cross-eyed, yeah? your forehead starts to crease up, <laughs> your belly can start to get tight. And, this is, and then when you, when you begin to see through that, not by forcing and not by doing, there comes a time when the mind lets go of that. Yeah? And then you can actually find peace with it. Yeah? That's what we mean by letting go. It's not something you can do. It's something that the mind happens, the mind, that happens when the mind is ready. It just does that. And then you realize that that, that tightness I had around that it's just not there anymore. Yeah? That's that gone. So that's very much the experience of uh, going into jhana is something like that. That it's not... Uh, that, that, that feeling of, 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 of tightness and attachment around one's meditation will keep on recurring. Right? So when you've let that go around the breath, tightening around the breath, you let that go, you think, oh, okay, I've let that go, that's good. And that's attachment again, yeah? Because you attach to the idea of letting go of the holding on. Yeah? And so then that will gradually build up again, and the tightness will build up again. And then you let go of it again. And it goes through these cycles of holding on and then letting go. And this is just the process of the mind coming into balance. And eventually, when that process reaches its perfection and its culmination, it's almost like this excruciating, uh, agonizing, uh, feeling of, of this incredible subtlety of watching your meditation object, what's the meditation object, and then being able to let go of it. And the letting go at that stage again happens completely free of any act of will. Uh, it just happens. Having said which, uh, it is true that people who are very skilled in meditation can uh, make determinations around these things, okay, so that they can say, you know, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to go into first jhana for half an hour, and then I'm going to come out of it. Okay, so it's possible to do that for somebody who's very skilled. Yeah, right? but when we're developing it, when we're first coming to that, then we, we can't do it like that. Yeah? That will be that would that would um, uh, create too much of a force in the mind, and also tends to create a lot of delusion. If we have expectations about what we want to get, we'll convince ourselves that we've got something that we haven't had. Okay? So this is very important to remember. 
particularly when we start talking about jhanas or any kind of state of meditation. Like, you, you know, you, you may have noticed that if you, if you come along to my talks regularly, I don't talk about these things all that often in Dhamma talks. And one of the reasons is because as soon as we start talking about it a lot, invariably you get a lot of overestimation. Okay? And as soon as you start talking about any kind of stage of meditation, people get attached to the idea of it. And, and you, you develop a culture where people are trying to get a particular stage uh, rather than realizing the point of it is to be able to understand your own mind and to let go of your own defilements, not to get some kind of stage so you can compare with each other and compete. All right? But the only reason we talk about these stages is to give a roadmap so we've got an idea, so we can check how we're going and where we can go in future. That's all. Okay? So it's just, a, it's just a practical, it's a pragmatic uh, guidance that gives us some direction and some orientation in our practice. Now, when that time of reaching the uh, uh, jhana happens, it will usually come after we've been sitting for a long time, Become, becomes more and more peaceful, we develop the meditation object, the meditation transforms itself into light. We see what we call the nimitta, a bright uh, vision or light or radiance appears in our mind. Uh, but that when that at first appears, there's still a sense of separation. Okay, So it's still me over here contemplating that nimitta over there. Now when that nimitta is very bright and very powerful and very stable, uh, we call that the, the Patibhaga Nimitta, and that comes into the mind like the, the rising sun. Okay? It appears with the power and the glory of the rising sun, and it chases and forces out of the mind any kind of darkness, any kind of tiredness, any kind of restlessness. But there's still a degree of separation there, so we don't call this jhana. This is what we call Upachara Samadhi. And that state of upachara samadhi is neighborhood or access concentration. But the best, best translation is threshold concentration. It's on the threshold of jhana. And that, can la that is a very beautiful state of mind. It's very subtle, it's very powerful, and it can last for a long time. Okay? So you can be in that state of threshold concentration for you know, anywhere... If it's less than 20 to 30 minutes, then I wouldn't consider it to be uh, th proper threshold concentration or pachara samadhi, uh, but it can last for several hours. Okay, So you can be in that state for several hours without going into jhana. The word threshold concentration, that's what it really means. So this is uh, why I don't like that sometimes it's translated as neighborhood concentration, but neighborhood means down the street and round the corner. Okay, That's not what upachara is. And sometimes it's translated as access, but access means like the way you get into something, but that's not what upachara means. Like the literal word upachara means the front porch. Okay, So the, 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 the bit out here where the step is in Pali would be called the upachara of this room. Okay. So that's what it means. It's literally the threshold. It's just a step away. So that upachara is literally a step away from the jhana. And there's nothing that you can or should do to step from one place into the other. Okay? In fact, what you have to do is precisely to stop doing. And so this is why Ajahn Chah would say, uh, you have to get to that place where you don't step forward, you don't step back, and most importantly of all, you don't stand still. Yeah, because standing still is just another doing, right? During the whole meditation, when you're developing meditation, that's what you do, isn't it? You try to stand still, yeah, and you try to stand still with your meditation object, and that's still another doing, is the standing still. So you have to get to that place where you're not even standing still. And when that happens, when the will lets go of itself, then the mind comes into uh, a sense of unification, Now, the synonym for jhana or samadhi in, in, in the Buddhist scriptures is always, it says, one-pointedness one of mind, citta kagata. And that uh, is, I think, um, based on a profound meaning of one-pointedness of mind. The Buddha always said that these states of jhana and states of samadhi are very profound states. They're not something which is 
uh, necessarily easy to attain. They're not something which uh, can be developed through casual application. They're things which uh, is an inherent potential of the human mind. They're things which uh, can and probably are attained um, by quite a few people and can be because people have very different spiritual uh, uh, sort of talents just like any other skill. Development of meditation is just like any other skill and people vary widely in their aptitude. And so some people can no doubt uh, like the story of the Buddha, uh, the Bodhisatta, sitting when he was a young boy and sitting in meditation under the, the tree and just sort of going naturally into jhana. And to me, that, that's, that aspect of the Buddha's biography seems very, very realistic. And I'm sure that that happens actually quite a lot. I've, I've talked, for example, a friend of mine is a meditator uh, and a very, very reliable uh, monk who's had a lot of experience since being a monk with samadhi and jhana practice. And he told me that he had an experience when he was a young man before he was a monk and before he'd started meditating. And looking back on it now, you know, he thinks that that was uh, an experience of, of uh, a jhana that he got into, yeah? or at least certainly very close to it. Unfortunately, he was driving a car at the time, so it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't actually a particularly skillful use of the mind. He did have a car crash, but uh, these things can happen. So it can happen through more or less like just the natural mind naturally flowing in a direction. And that's, in a way, the best way that it can happen yeah? because it's not the result of a technique. And this is what we can often mistake is we mistake the tech. We think it's the technique that's done it for us. Yeah? And this is going to uh, get us into jhanas. You know, I've known many monks, for this just an example, who have uh, heard of good meditation monasteries, yeah? Oh, lots of people doing jhanas in those monasteries. For example, the most popular one in recent years has been the Paok Monastery in, in Myanmar. And a very good monastery, a lot of great meditation going on there, very good teachings on samadhi. And so monks hear about this thing, right, I've got to go there and get my jhanas. And they go there and it doesn't do anything for them. Right? It's completely meaningless. right? Because uh, it's not the technique, it's not the place, it's not the teacher. Yeah? It's, it's about the internal development. It's not to say that, that, you know, that those conditions shouldn't be there, but it's just to say you can't mistake those externals for the actual, the actual real work is the work that we're doing inside. So the, the, the trick to it, even though I think it's quite not uncommon that people might go and might slip into it, Dana, by accident, the trick to it is to be able to, to repeat it, to develop it, to do it regularly. This is the, the important thing. And so this just is practice. There's nothing really that... that um, that you can do to, um, to make that happen. But nevertheless, there are some things that we can do that will support that uh, and support us to be able to develop jhana more regularly. Uh, one important thing is to maintain a regularity and an evenness in practice. Okay? Another important thing is um, the development of samatha and vipassana in balance. Okay? If we just devote ourselves purely to developing a concentration practice, yeah, just one thing only, then that can lead our mind into samadhi more quickly, but it will also lead to a certain uh, fragility of mind and the fragility of our meditation. If we combine that with development of also of vipassana and understanding, understanding of conditionality, understanding the nature of sense experience, all of these things, understanding the nature of, con of, of letting go, uh, then our meditation will be more balanced and more robust. Okay? It will develop more evenly. So these are just some tips to help that happen more evenly. But then when it happens, it happens. And there comes that moment when one's been developing meditation, gone through all the stages, and then the mind comes together and we enter what we call the first jhana. And as I said, that's defined or characterized by one-pointedness of mind, and that one-pointedness is meant in a profound sense. Now, what I understand by that is that, first of all, uh, it's one-pointedness of consciousness. That means that the five external consciousnesses cease. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, 
don't exist anymore. Right? You can't hear anything. You can't feel anything with your body. If somebody comes up and touches you, then uh, you won't feel it. Right? Somebody can snap their fingers next to your ears, you won't react to the sound. Okay? So external uh, 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 sense awareness has finished. Okay? The second thing is that in one pointedness of um, one pointedness in time, okay, so that uh, one that awareness stays the same for a long period of time. Okay, it's not shifting from one object to the other. If your mind is shifting from one object to the other, this is not one pointedness. Okay, this is many pointedness. So the mind, over a long period of time, sustains its attention on just one thing. And the third uh, aspect of one-pointedness that I think is important is it means one-pointedness of, uh, of object or one-pointedness with the object. Uh, and that means that uh, there's no sense of separation between the consciousness, the observing consciousness, and the actual object itself. Okay? That sense of separation dissolves. Everyone becomes one with the object. So all of these three, of course, you're not sitting there analyzing these things as they happen. It's just an experience. Uh, but when reflecting on it afterwards, you can reflect on these different aspects of it and to see whether all of these things were present during, the, during that uh, experience. Now, in that first jhana, is the, the weakest level of um, so what we call samadhi, or right samadhi, there's still a subtle movement of the mind, a subtle, Ajahn Brahm describes it as a wobbling of the mind. Okay? Now the technical term for this in, in, in Pali we call vitaka vichara. What vitaka vichara means in this context is, is that basically it's that the mind is uh, decided, mind is, has come together with the object, yeah? okay? but because it's still close to ordinary consciousness and close to, to the world of the five senses, it's still not completely confident in that. Okay? It's still not completely confident in that. And so it tends to push a little bit. Okay? So it's just, it's just pushing on, the mind's still pushing onto the object. It's a little, it's a little bit, doesn't want, to let, doesn't want to let go of it. And because it's pushing onto it, there's still a, a very subtle kind of residual uh, uh, force there. And then when the mind pushes, then the object kind of recedes a little bit. And then the mind comes in again and pushes onto it again, and the mind recedes a little bit. So this is a subtle rhythm or wobble about it. It's not, it's not, it's not kind of breaking the one-pointedness, but it's just almost like massaging the object as it's done. I mean, it's described as similes like the kind of the flapping of the bird's wing or something like that are used. This is almost this kind of slight rubbing of the object is the, that kind of vitaka vichara. That's the characteristic of the first jhana. And again, Ajahn Brahm describes it as being like a, a, a tennis ball. Okay? It's, a bit, it's, it's perfectly round and, and smooth and so on, but it's a bit fuzzy on the edges and it's a bit kind of wobbly if you press it. Yeah? So the first jhana is a bit like a tennis ball. Second jhana, mind is characterized by uh, complete one-pointedness and great internal confidence and clarity. And so again, Ajahn Brahm describes that as being like a bowling ball. Okay? So it's completely round and defined, and uh, there's no ambiguity at all. So this, this, this is the second jhana, that wobbling ceases, the wobbling of vitaka vichara ceases completely, and the mind is characterized by a sense of rapture, which is an uplift in the, in the mind, and also bliss. Okay? Now these two terms, the rapture and bliss, are two different... Um, the uh, two different words for the emotional tone of the experience. Okay, now think about drinking a glass of champagne. Okay, you drink a glass of champagne. The 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 fizziness of it is the rapture. Okay, and the 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 the, the richness of it or the sweetness of it is the bliss. Okay, there's two different aspects. Okay, and that's that's what rapture and bliss uh, rapture and bliss is piti sukha. So the second jhana, both of those things are there. Then after some time, that fizziness 
which is a, that sense of slight uplift within the body and the mind, uh, is seen as being slightly agitating. And so that fades away and one's left purely with the sense of tranquility and bliss. Okay. Now that, and this is what we call the third jhana. In the third jhana, the feeling of bliss is similar to the second jhana. What's changed is our emotional response to that. So that again, that feeling of rapture, the uplift, the fizz, is like an emotional response to the pleasant feeling. And it's a slightly excited emotional response to the pleasant feeling. Of course, excited is all rel <laughs> relative, right? But slightly excited. Now that goes and one is, it has an, an attitude of equanimity towards the pleasant feeling. And this is what we call third jhana. Okay. Now, it's interestingly t interesting to contemplate like how stable or how pure these different these different jhanic experiences are, and each each one of these experiences, according to the Buddhist cosmology, corresponds with a particular realm of rebirth. So, if you get into the first jhana, develop that regularly, you get born into the Brahma realms, okay, and you live there for a, a, an eon, right? So that's pretty good. An eon from the time from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch. If you get into second jhana, you get two eons. Right? If you get third jhana, you get four eons. Okay? And if you get fourth jhana, you get 500 eons. Okay? So that's very interesting. Eh? It's to show the, the, the difference in the level of stability of fourth jhana compared with the other ones. And that's because that, even that pleasant feeling, that very subtle pleasant feeling has faded away as well. So there's complete, total equanimity yeah, and mindfulness. Complete, total equanimity and mindfulness. And so this is described in terms, it's just like uh, pure, bright mind, pure, bright consciousness. Okay. Now that fourth jhana uh, is always regarded throughout the Buddhist scriptures as being the ideal foundation for the development of, of deep levels of insight. Yeah, and uh, countless times through the uh, uh, suttas we find the Buddha teaching these four jhanas and then based on these four jhanas one develops various kinds of higher uh, uh, knowledges uh, and understandings. So I've given some uh, indication of uh, these uh, experiences of what they're like and uh, you know, when we're talking about these things and when we're thinking about them, we need to maintain a, a, a balance in our understanding of it. And so on the one hand, there's always this tendency to reduce jhanas and to say and to treat them as being something which is quite mundane, something simple, it's easy to attain. Yeah? And there are quite a lot of te Dhamma teachers out there who teach jhanas in this way. And they, they teach what I would believe are quite shallow states of concentration and then will tell their students that they've got jhanas. And uh, sometimes you can even find that the students will be sceptical about these claims. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, there's, there's, a, there's another tendency to, to make jhanas into something which are, is completely esoteric, completely impossible to attain, uh, just a kind of a fantasy of kind of spiritual supermen who can attain these things. Yeah? And again, I think that's too extreme. If we look at the, what the Buddha said, the Buddha said that we can attain these things if we try. Yeah? And if we put the work in, if we're dedicated, gradually, little bit by little bit, we can attain them because they are the natural potential of the mind. Yeah, it's very important to remember that. It's not something, you know, special or alien or, or, or esoteric or anything like that. It's just that ordinary peacefulness of mind which you have all experienced when you've gone out at night and you've looked at the stars and you see the vastness of space yeah? and you've seen the lights shining there and you've, there's been a coolness and a sense of wonder. That same peace of mind, if you take that and develop that, is exactly the same thing as the experience of jhana. It's not something else. Yeah? So in our development of this practice, we keep this in the back of our mind that, yeah, this is what we should be doing. This is part of the Eightfold Path. Whenever the Buddha talked about 
spiritual practice. He talked about the Eightfold Path. He talked about the five spiritual faculties or the five spiritual powers or the four idipadas or the seven awakening factors or threefold training and all the different ways that the Buddha talked about practice. And he always included the four jhanas invariably. There's no exceptions to that. There's not one single uh, major or important framework for practice in the Buddha's path where he leaves out the four jhanas. Okay? Nowhere. So they are an essential part of our practice. We should uh, have the aim to be able to achieve these things. Uh, but we should go about that humbly and carefully and uh, in, in a, uh, a, a, a simple-hearted and dedicated fashion. It's just this is our job. This is our duty. We want to practice the Eightfold Path. We go about it in this way. As we're developing, as we're moving towards that, the good part about it is that we don't have to wait until the experience of jhanas itself to get the benefits. Each step of the way, we're finding a degree of peace of mind, a degree of happiness, a degree of contentment, uh, which is giving nourishment to the heart. We don't have to wait till the end of the path before experiencing that. So this is my little talk for you this evening on jhanas and practice of devout jhanas. And uh, hopefully you can all do it. So any comments or questions?